Every specimen, like these extinct little potteroos or rat kangaroos, is filled with critical information about our world and the state of our environment. The kinds of questions and puzzles are enormous. If you want to understand what was this species, what was it related to, what did it eat, where did it live, why did it go extinct, all those kinds of questions you need to get access to the specimen itself. Maybe we can study its DNA. Maybe we can study this chemistry of its skin and reconstruct what it ate. Those types of marvelous things that we can do with modern science. So only by looking after these specimens in these cabinets do we really kind of end that chaos and bring some order and organization to our understanding of life on Earth. And it's never been more important. Australia has the worst record of mammal extinction on the planet, with 50 animal species lost since the museum started collecting specimens in the 1860s. None more famous than the one I'm dying to see, the thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger. You've got more than one. Yeah, we do, and some of them are just absolute stunners. So I always get a bit sad when I yeah. look into this cabinet. I know, We're yeah. reflecting on something that is no longer with us. Yeah, it's sort of bittersweet because it's exciting because it's such a famous extinct animal in Australia and the world, so it's exciting to see it. But yeah, it's also bittersweet it's still not with us. Absolutely. In September 1936, only two months after the species was granted protected status, the last known individual died. We always kind of look yeah. at the tag to tell the story. Yeah. And, uh, what you know, year were you looking at there? This one, it says, uh, came to the museum August 14th, 1890. This is a specimen of a thylacine yeah. that's never been on display. It's only wow. ever been carefully curated outside of the light in a climate controlled area here behind the scenes in the museum. Okay. And it shows that kind of rich, uh, gray-brown color and the, the dark yeah. stripes, uh, just a much more richly colored animal than most people imagine. These furry remains could contain even more scientific insights. But Chris is keen for me to see a special specimen, preserved in a very different way. This is our famous little thylacine pup. That is outstanding. This would have to be the most famous specimen in the wet collection, is that fair? I think it might be. It has kind of an iconic status. It's this heartbreaking picture of a well-developed thylacine pup, and it's preserved entirely intact. Stored wet in an alcohol solution, scientists have access to the entire animal, every part of its anatomy, and even its genomic sequence. So I have to ask you, can you get DNA from this? Yeah, you can get DNA. Because it was preserved in ethanol and not uh, in formaldehyde or formalin like many of our other specimens, it's actually a pretty good source of DNA. Now, you probably get annoyed being asked this, but could the thylacine be brought back to life? A lot of people have that question. It's really one of the main things people want to know about the thylacine. And to me, the answer is always going to be no. And one of the reasons is that the thylacine is such a uh, isolated type of mammal on the family tree. You might think, well, maybe it's related to Tasmanian devils or quolls or other carnivorous marsupials. It is, but only very distantly, in the same way that a dog is sort of related to a cat. So a very, very, very distant relative. And without a close relative, you're lacking basically almost all the tools you need as a biologist to ever have a chance of bringing this back. And if you brought it back, you could have a thylacine plague <laughs> too, which would be, which would be, be annoying, many, wouldn't too it? Too many thylacines. You bring them back and then there's too They're many. They're everywhere, yeah. yeah. 